Anger and the rest of our emotions are not very well defined. We know they exist, but to what extent, how often they occur, and for what purpose is left a little ambiguous. Yet, in arguably clearing up and specifying what our emotions mean would prove very helpful in learning to manage and control them. Individually defining our emotions and our focus of anger would be a great starting point to acting with more attention to intention. That is to say, to focus on behaving the way we want rather than reacting without reason. Common definitions of anger look pretty useless for this exploration. I mean, look at it. Anger is annoyance and annoyance is irritation and anger. And oh, irritation is annoyance and anger. Anger usually doesn't need to be defined in a proper sense because the feeling is universal. You can just point and say, that stuff is anger. Since we don't have to be perfect here, it is helpful to consider anger as a reaction to some contradiction. Young children throw a fuss when what they want and what they have are in opposition. We feel flustered when the things we have to do and the time we have to do them cannot coexist. We are bothered when we ought to be left alone and others somehow have no knowledge of objective personal space, which should be impossible. The reality of life tends to disregard all of your expectations of it and somehow finds a way to spite and oppose all your beliefs and show you just how contradictory things may seem, which can be confusing for us, but mostly aggravating. Considering anger as a contradiction allows us to call up some aid to discover its purpose. Our friends over in dialectical land love this idea of contradiction. The dialectical thinkers say that all things in life are in flux. They flow and bend and twist and move. Every object in the real world is always in a constant process of changing and evolving, whether or not they appear to be. Originally an early thought with the Greeks, greatly expanded by the German idealists and crafted intensely by their followers, the dialectics represent the nature in which the world changes. They say, change and motion involve contradiction and can only take place through contradictions. It's like a line of slow accumulated change that is interrupted by sudden and explosive periods of rapid acceleration. Change is a constant struggle between action and reaction. First, tension builds up between forces, slowly expanding in energy, but not readily apparent until a critical point where the bonds of nature can no longer hold fast and chaos ensues. All too familiar are moments where one sly remark in a seemingly docile environment explodes into a disaster of an argument of two furious individuals. The rage and anger could not have possibly been the result of one small provocation, but instead the dramatic change occurs to the essential movement within the buildup, all the tiny details that rub the wrong way the ones we thought we ignored and had long forgotten. It's never entirely noticeable, the impact of each incremental change, but all the pieces together as a whole form a greater sum than their parts, thus the contradiction. It's like a powder keg where each granule of black powder on its own holds little effect, but the potency of its chain reactions inflict massive damage. When we view powder kegs and eruptions of anger, we do not often consider them to be a good thing. I mean, destruction is bad, right? But dialectical thinkers say that this view may be too short-sighted, that the real beauty is what happens and remains after the destruction. Consider a great fire that may scorch a forest or devastate an entire ecology but with it can scramble up and expose new soil and rich resources for the environment to thrive and heal. This notion of rebirth and the cycle of life and death runs as a constant pattern throughout life and is commandeered adamantly by wielders of the dialectics. Old man Hegel was perhaps the father of the dialectical method and his big thing was applying the process to history. He believed that throughout all history, we could see the actualizations of dialectics through the use of this super trendy buzzword, zeitgeist. 
Zeitgeist is a mystical idea commonly understood as the spirit of an age, whereby the times in human history demands the clashing of opposing forces to progress history, and more specifically, humanity. Zeitgeist sneaks under the radar, pulling the strings of who and what rises to popularity and control, and how these bodies build, fall, and ultimately stabilize within their environment. It is the soul which embodies movements in history. The conception of zeitgeist throughout history is the reason Hegel loved war. War to Hegel is a great synthesizer. He saw states and powers to be in constant opposition to one another. The entities were almost as if they were individuals with their own feelings and will that needed to be strengthened or perish. And so war was an opportunity which caused the state's contradictions to become its downfall or lead to a better resulting good, as required and demanded by the underlying spirit of their times. The natural order of chaos to stability sounds fine and good, but does it really work like that? I mean, to say that war completely obliterates all stagnation to start anew would be a grand synthesis, but I'm not quite sure if social upheavals of that caliber really occur as much as Hegel could suggest. We spot that anger, like war, is a reaction to an internal contradiction, and in Hegel's eyes, this might do some good, as all things will tend to turn out for the better and a synthesis can form. But Hegel's genius of finding the good is on its head because the synthesis requires a sufficient buildup from real situational details. Hegel points to the toilet paper and says this created a synthesis, but he pays little attention to the other contradictions which made no change at all, even though these could be an indicator of the dramatic shift. Hegel believes that the world will ideally progress and turn out better through synthesis. The problem that this covers up is that contradiction does not always lead to the good as claimed. Sometimes nothing ends up changing and the contradiction still persists. Two warring states may not change after the fact. They may just be beat up and nothing is the better or different. This is the same deficiency that anger suffers. Anger is a reaction with the purpose of creating a positive change or to restore balance, but lots of times it's just a waste of energy. It is important to solve the contradictions in our life, but now it also seems important to be strategic in the method used. You already spot that anger is a reaction to a contradiction. You also spot that this reaction is probabilistically not going to lead to a synthesis. What's left to determine is when alternate methods different from this reaction are necessary to remedy the contradiction. Anger works when you declare opposition to some other thing, in which you can completely absorb the other side and tyrannize the space to claim that you are the objective good. The contradiction is settled because one side just becomes the good, as it is the winners who write the history. Anger does not work when your opposition is an unchangeable reality, like a belief, institution, or a group of people. Anger will just lead to more chaos in this case instead of creating a synthesis. You see, being angry makes other people angry, and angry people often do not accept other points of view as easily. I know, it's crazy. Your anger may spread into more anger, which spreads further, effectively shutting down a willingness to change among large groups. This chain reaction is commonly understood in dialectics, and the rapid acceleration of chaos supposedly leads to a balance at the end. This is where we have to take a step back. Understanding our anger at, say, like, internet people or any other amorphous blob is not like water molecules boiling, or an active battlefield where the two sides are stuck in the interaction. This enemy is more elusive. If everyone is angry and no one turns into steam or dies, then there's no way to create a synthesis here. Angry people will continue to roam the world and exist. This is why it's important to be attentive to intentions. We have to stop and consider that anger is an indicator of contradiction. 
and decide if the anger can achieve its purpose of synthesis. We must ask ourselves, what is it that we want or expect? This is one half of the contradiction. The other half is the reality of not having the thing wanted, or that reality itself is opposing those expectations. If our wants are to dispose of all things which we oppose, our view may be too short-sighted. We cannot continue to expect an ideal world in an uncontrollable reality, else we succumb to a very angry existence. This doesn't have to be a jaded takeaway as well, to accept wrong. It is up to you to decide how much of the world we can actionably change for good and how much we should take in stride to live a more peaceful, contradiction-free life. Okay, thanks.